As our world gets smaller, and what happens somewhere else, it's closer and closer to home. There's so much the world wants to know. We don't know a lot of things. There's a lot of questions out there. People very insecure. It's not enough to know we're interconnected. We have to understand how and collaborate to build a better future. Your answers matter more than ever. Thank you for your vital work. Well, happy GIS Day to you, to everyone, actually. Uh, this is a special day. It's now in its 21st year, this celebration. And the idea behind it was to uh, sh share and illuminate the incredible work going on by GIS professionals around the world to the rest of the world. So that means opening up and sharing to managers or your colleagues in other departments or in other organizations the power of what geography, geographic science, and GIS tools are really delivering in today's world. And they are doing an amazing job. They're responding to virtually every kind of activity. They're making things more efficient. They're making decisions better. They're addressing the big challenges like COVID this year opening and illuminating the world's eyes to what's going on, how we're all interconnected. It's uh, being used in fighting fires and disaster response and making cities safer and uh, looking at how to organize our information so we can make better decisions in planning and in resource allocation. Anyway, you know all of that. Now, this is the time to celebrate, to connect with your colleagues in other organizations, to share with kids in school to inspire them to look to geography as a way to create a better world. Building the next generation is a part of the GIS Day celebration. Let me close by simply saying thank you for all of your work and happy GIS Day. Hi, 
My name is Mike Clevel. I am the Hazard Mitigation and GIS Manager with the Department of Disaster Management. In this short documentary, we will be looking at the important role of geographic information systems, better known as GIS. How it is used not only in disaster management, but in other departments and agencies throughout the Turks and Caicos Islands. The month of November is designated for raising awareness and highlighting the importance of geography and GIS. As a matter of fact, Geography Awareness Week is celebrated annually during the third week of November. It was established by presidential proclamation more than 25 years ago as a way to educate people and how the decisions that they make in everyday life affect the world we live in. Geography can be best described as the study of places and the relationship between people and their environment. This year's Geography Awareness Week is November the 15th to the 21st. Added to this annual celebration is the Geographic Information System, better known as GIS Day, which will be on November the 18th this year. The theme for this year is Inspire the World Through GIS. GIS is a scientific framework for gathering, analyzing, and visualizing geographic data to help us make better decisions. On GIS Day, we help others learn about geography and the real world application of GIS that are making a difference in society. It is a chance for us to share our accomplishments and inspire others to discover and use GIS. GIS technology is a growing industry and new innovations are constantly being developed. Unmanned aerial vehicles, that is UAVS, or drones are now being utilized to acquire instant imagery and to help solve problems in such areas as environmental protection, pollution, land use, conservation, disaster management, and even crime activity. Even though celebrating may be a little bit different this year, sharing with you our passion for GIS is more important than ever. And we hope that you become inspired to use GIS technology. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joanna Wilson, Public Information Manager at DDME. And I'm Kevin DeBello, Hazard Mitigation Officer at DDME. Today, we join hundreds of organizations worldwide as we celebrate Geographic Information Systems, better known as GISD. So join us as we explore the various departments and agencies across the TCI and see how they utilize GIS in their daily operations. Kevin, I'm ready for the tour. Where are we headed first? Well, as you said tour, the first thing came to mind was the airport. Perfect! Turks and Caicos Airport, here we come. Let's go. Hello, my name is Floyd Ingham, the Acting CEO for the Airport Authority. We'd like to welcome the DDME to the airport and its operations. We use geographical information to ensure safe and secure operations. Geographical information is used to ensure the correct alignment of our runways, our taxiways, and our aprons. We also use geographical information to ensure that buildings or any other obstructions that are within the eardrum area are within the correct operating limits. My name is Emmanuel Rigby from the Turks and Caicos Airports Authority. GIS is important to us and I want to speak from a navigation standpoint um, what we use GIS for. Um, and we could start from weather data. Um, we are responsible for providing weather information 
to the to, to flights operating within the Turks and Caicos Islands. And GIS is so important in, in obtaining these data. We also look at our, our charts that we use for air navigation purposes. The charts are formulated um, from the aid of GIS. We also um, look, look at other areas like the approach plates that the aircraft would use to make an approach into the island. Um, all of these various points on the approach plates is GIS fixed. All of our navigation aids that we use at the airdrome, like PAPI's uh, Precision Approach Path Indicator, that would align the aircraft to land on the runway, is GIS um, positioned. We also have the VOR, that it's a homing device where pilots would find the Turks and Caicos um, or you will find islands in the Turks and Caicos and home in. So, and that's another aid that is supported by GIS. We, all of these various aids are tied in to our approach um, charts. And so we have um, airborne charts that would tie into the ground aid. And it's, it, it's all made possible to GIS. So Joe, that was some really interesting information and it was exciting to see how the airport actually uses GIS on a day-to-day -day basis. Kevin, I never thought about it from the airport authority perspective. Now I know every time we board a plane, GIS is one of the many tools utilized to make sure we have a safe and secure flight. But before we move on, Kevin, how did GIS come about in the first place? What's the history behind it? That's an interesting question, Joanna, because there's a lot of history on GIS. Mm -hmm. um, the GIS as a field or as a discipline is quite a, a young field. When I say young, in the mid-1800s, that is where GIS really kicked off. However, geographic information is something that we use for a very long time, even way before the 1800s. However, in the 1850s, there was a physician by the name of John Snow. Snow? Not John Snow from John Game Wick? of Thrones. Okay, no. okay, okay. <laughs> Another John Snow. But this individual, um, he was studying an epidemic that was occurring in London. Okay. Right? So, what he decided to do is to map the deaths, mm -hmm. where the, all the deaths were occurring. And he also mapped other information. And one of the things that he mapped was the location of water pumps. Okay. Now, at the time they were studying, he was actually studying cholera. But they didn't know it was cholera at the time. But because he was able to isolate these two specific data, he was able to make a correlation or find a trend or a pattern between those instances where there were high cases of, of deaths or, or cholera and the locations of water pumps. So he was able to determine that where there were more pumps, mm -hmm. there were high deaths. So it was a waterborne related disease. Yes, yes. Okay. So this is, is, is some of the ways in which GIS is even used today, right? Um, and it's still relevant coming from that history way back in the 1800s. So, you know, GIS is something that is very applicable and it doesn't really lose its relevance. From 1850 to 2020, tracking of diseases, tracking of hazards, tracking of systems. As you mentioned that scenario with Mr. Snow, it reminded me of how we're using um, GIS to track COVID-19 in the present 2020 pandemic. Yes, definitely. And, and you have been seeing the maps on, on news and so on and being put out by various governments across the world mm -hmm. um, as they continue to monitor various situations that are unfolding with COVID-19. So the map data from this cholera outbreak was able to show us a pattern or a trend where they were able to isolate what was the true issue. 
I think this is similar to how we're using data tracking and GIS with the COVID-19 pandemic, where we have contact tracing, um, monitoring of quarantines, all these type of stuff. So GIS is also important for Ministry of Health and the general public at large. Yes, definitely. Um, GIS has been playing a, a really instrumental role mm -hmm. in sort of managing the, the entire COVID-19 situation globally. Mm -hmm. And you would see a lot of those maps being produced um, within the news or by governments. And it, it really does play a critical role because some of the things that you would notice on a map, you might not notice by just looking at the numbers. figures on a table or numbers, right? So, and, and vice versa, things that you would see on a map, you might not be able to statistically analyze in your head mm -hmm. um, what the situation is in order to make certain implementations and enforcement. So yes, GIS is, as it was relevant back then, mm -hmm. it is just as relevant now. Okay, Kevin, where to next? How about we go down to the planning department? Happy GIS Day. My name is Leonardo Glasgow. I'm a planning technician here at the Department of Planning in Providenciales. And I'm going to tell you how we use GIS on a daily basis. How do we use GIS on a daily basis? First thing in the morning, we turn on our computers, we open up SIGTAS, and then we open up GIS. GIS is a crucial software we use every day from customers stakeholders and even colleagues it is a vital tool in the operation of the planning department we have to check land zoning usage by via gis all that information is calculated and inputted into our system thereby we can check the zoning of a specific parcel for our customers we can use GIS on the ground in real time mapping when we go out into the field. If we identify something, we can select a parcel and then identify it, add notes, add a different color variation to that parcel and it be uploaded into our system. GIS is also very useful as it gives us near to accurate dimensions from our system on the ground in real time. We use GIS on a daily basis. For example, if someone were to come into our office and say, I live in Long Bay. I don't know my block and parcel. I don't know my application number, but I do know what street I live on. We can pull up the GIS map, sit down with a client, and they can walk us through where they live and we can identify their specific block and parcel and give that information to them and so that they can have for their records. GIS is very, very crucial in our operation and it helps us and it moves things along a lot quicker than if we had to go and use old maps on a wall or had to go and look through our register book. We get about 10 to 20 applications daily in Providenciales. If I had to go and look for John Brown's name when he comes in, through our application logbook, it'll take me forever. But if John Brown were to give me his block and parcel, I can pull that up on GIS and I can quickly identify what application is specific to John Brown. GIS is the tool for us. So Kev, the Department of Planning demonstrated to us how they utilize GIS to plot lands, to measure different landscapes, etc. How, what tools does the DDM utilize to capture GIS data? Well, we use a range of different tools and it spans all the way from your regular everyday use cell phone mm -hmm. to more specialized um, GPS equipment. And based on the application that we're going to be using it for, it will determine which equipment we choose. Um, so, for example, we might utilize uh, a cell phone or maybe a deployment team, if they go into the field, they might utilize a cell phone or tablet to capture um, information on a building, right? 
And when I speak about accuracy, what I mean is that um, the known location on the Earth's surface that you are capturing, you may have accuracy within maybe 4 to 10 meters if you use a tablet or a phone. Now if you're capturing information on a building, a building has a quite large footprint, maybe 30, 40 um, square meters. Um, so that would be you know, sufficient to collect that type of information. However, as we move to smaller objects on the Earth's surface, we need a much higher accuracy. So we might use more specialized equipment to capture that information. Okay. We also capture information using devices, uh, um, including drones. Uh -huh. With a drone, what we're able to do is take an image, a high resolution image of the Earth's surface. And then what we can do from that is to actually digitize, what we call digitizing or tracing out features from that image. So an example from an aerial image, you might be able to identify buildings, roads, and so on. So you'll be able to trace over that image and extract additional information from it to create data. Similarly, with satellite images, we do the same thing. When you have a satellite image, you can, you can pinpoint where particular species might be. Um, you might have lakes, rivers, you know, you'd be able to extract that, those information uh -huh. from those images and create new data from it. So there's a range, a wide range of equipment and tools that we utilize to capture GIS data. Specifically to DDME, how is GIS utilized at the Department of Disaster Management and Emergencies? Well, GIS plays such an integral part of most of what we do at DDME. Um, and if we think about the disaster management cycle, we have it right here, from mitigation to preparedness to response and recovery. At each phase, mm -hmm. you know, GIS plays such a major role. Okay, um, let's dive a little bit more into preparedness and mitigation. When you say GIS and data, what type of data are you talking about and how is it utilized? All right, we, we actually, we capture a lot of different data across DCI. Um, and it all has to do with specific hazards that we expect that we might be impacted by. Um, so when we talk about pre-impact data, we look at things like where populations are and what are the demographics. We want to know who is vulnerable and where they're located. So we, we need to capture information on um, things like where is the elderly population, where is the the dependent population. Mm -hmm. um, if we have to evacuate a particular area, we need to have that information at hand before the event actually occurs. So that is very critical. Um, we also cap want to capture information about buildings mm -hmm. because buildings house people. And if buildings are vulnerable, then people who are in those buildings are also vulnerable. And of course, our mandate is to save lives. Yes. So we want to capture um, information to make an assessment, a risk assessment on the various buildings that people uh, um, occupy. So what we do is go into the field in, the, in these various flood prone areas, for example, and capture information on, on buildings like how many floors a buildings might have, what type of material it's bu is built from, mm -hmm. are they following particular building codes, all these things um, that would dictate how we actually prepare, right? What sort of resources can we um, deploy ahead of, of a storm, for instance? Or what sort of mitigation strategies or education strategies is needed based on what we see in the field, right? We also capture information with regards to things like drainage. We want to know what drainage installations are where. So when we actually put that information in GIS, we can then run our models to see what flooding might look like for a high, high rate rainfall event. Okay. Now this sounds very familiar to some of the information we give to the public in their own household family emergency plan and preparing. You're talking about conducting a risk assessment, knowing what hazards you are vulnerable to and what's going to be your plan. 
because based on your location, your GPS coordinate, yes. we can then pinpoint what are the risks surrounding your area. Are you in a flood prone area? Do I need to have an evacuation route? Is there an alternative? All these information plays part of GIS and disaster preparedness planning. Yes, and let me also mention that another key set of information that we capture um, relates to critical facilities or essential lifelines or, or critical infrastructure. All these um, objects that are out in the real world, they are so crucial um, in terms of, you know, if they are impacted, it really cripples the economy, yeah. it cripples the country, certain things you just can't, you know, come to a state of normalcy if these are impacted. And we need to know, we need to have the actual locations, we need to know where they are, how vulnerable they are, and should they be impacted, what would be the result? You know, we, and again, we create all these what-if scenarios in GIS, and that's the real power of GIS, to be able to to create those scenarios and analyze and ask certain questions and make these queries um, to the database in order to get this information before we actually impact it, in order to put certain mitigation strategies in place. So mitigation preparedness utilizes GIS. Moving on to the other sections of the disaster management cycle, how do we use GIS for response and recovery efforts? Okay, so for response, should we be impacted in the TCI, we have various deployment teams that would be deployed into the field and they would capture geographic information mm -hmm. and send it back to the NEOC or the National Emergency okay. Operations Center. And that is something that we have a, a great improvement and an increase in efficiency in, in recent times. Um, because we actually utilize GIS. Before we had GIS, what would happen is that these personnel will go out in the field with paper forms and they would have to record the damage. One by one. Let's say if there was a hurricane, you would record if a building, house by house, if it was, if there's minor damage or moderate or severe damage or totally destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, go around the communities, these teams, and, and they would record that information. They would then finish what they're doing out in the field, come back to the office, then transcribe that data and then put it into the computer in, in a soft copy mm -hmm. and hand that over as a report. Um, that is a very long process. And tedious. Yes. <laughs> and in disaster management or response, time is everything. Yeah. Time is of the essence. And there is competition for resources as well. So doing these assessments um, in, within a certain time frame becomes very crucial. And GIS is one of the things that enables us to do that. Um, because we're able to capture that information in real time, so they are not using paper forms anymore. They are using cell phones and tablets to actually record that information, which also captures the location of where an incident has occurred. And not only to buildings, but also to critical infrastructure, like roads and bridges. So if those, those are impacted, or if there's areas that are flooded, they would record that information. So they're able to send that back to the NEOC in real time, where the decision makers can have an overall picture mm -hmm. of what has happened and where, and make certain decisions. And I think it also allows us to be able to go back into the field and verify our information. Yeah. So we definitely use light years throughout the disaster management cycle. Is there any other way other than damage assessment we use it in response? Yes, we also use GIS in response to keep track or help us with logistics to know what resources are deployed where mm -hmm. um, because that is very important when you're dealing with a disaster you want to prioritize um, your resources to the highest impact areas so we're able to keep track of what resources are where um, who has received what um, to know you know to manage the situation well and of course for us to return to normal as soon and as yes. soon as possible yes Kevin, you mentioned a couple of maps, critical maps to help in disaster management planning. 
how can the public access these maps and how can they utilize it within their disaster family planning? Right, so a lot of these maps are on our website, mm -hmm. which you can find at www.gov.tc slash DDME. You can find those maps there, which includes things like flood risk maps, and soon we will have interactive maps that you can actually go on and manipulate those maps. You can zoom in, you can find your location or your home or your property and you know, see where, where you are located in regards to certain risk mm. uh, or vulnerabilities that, um, that are across the TCI. Excellent. So don't hesitate, visit our website today and download those maps, identify your location, look at the hazards surrounding you and plan accordingly. GIS is Geographic Information System. It is a system used for capturing, storing, and visualized data in the forms of map. At Fortis TCI, we have a software that allows us to map our locations of our assets on top of the street maps, which is the parcel data and road maps. With this data, we are able to manage and properly report on the day-to-day -day activity of our assets in terms of field inspections, line designs, outages. Since our assets are spread out through the toxin cases in different islands, I'm able to manage and analyze this data from a locate position at my desk using software. At Fortis TCI, we use two different types of software. One is an engineering software, and one is basically a viewer, and also allows us to map and design our line extensions. Our mill soft suite is Windmill OMS IVR. Our partner suite is Field Design, Distribution Inspection, and Map Viewer. I think GIS is important because today in the world where technology is rapidly growing, it is used to make smarter and better decisions. One of our special features is our OMS, our outage management system. It shows the importance of having accurate data because it interfaces with our customer-driven information, which is our customer meters, locations, and address. Okay, on your mobile device, once you text out to the system, you will get a response from our system asking you which address. And this is important because most of our customers had more, more than one account. So for A, you will type A for, for example, Blue Hills, B for five keys. So I will confirm my address. And this also is important why your phone number has to match in our system. So the cust customer service information you provide to us is important in terms of your location, your address, your telephone number. Once you send it, you receive a confirmation, thank you, your outage has been recorded. As you can see here, the outage pops up on our system. This alerts our operators in the control room that sends an alarm that there's an outage in this area. And another reason why it's important, if my neighbor decides to text in also, what the system does is not only pick up his meter, it will go to the next device to say that there's a transformer out now. So our system would automatically send a message to every customer that is connected to that transformer, and we will send a message to you saying that we are aware of an outage. So you don't even have to call our system no more to report an outage once we confirm that it's an outage in the area. So Kev, which department are we going to next? Well, I wonder if our audience knows about any other departments that utilizes GIS. How about we ask them? Yeah. Which department do you believe utilize GIS within their daily operations? Yeah. 
If you answered E, you're correct. All of the above. But we're heading to the survey and mapping department. Hello everyone. I am DeMarco Williams, Assistant Director of Survey and Mapping Department. And I'm here to talk to you today about GIS. Well, for, for us in the Survey and Mapping Department, GIS is used to manage our land information. And every portion of property that's surveyed in the country has, has to be managed by the Survey and Mapping Department, whether it be a subdivision whether it be changing boundaries, all of that is managed by us. In order for us to best manage that, GIS is used. For example, if a surveyor, whether government or private, we're going to survey this portion of property here in Q. If, if, if it's subdivided into a half, for example, right down the middle here, that means that this portion would accumulate two new survey points. Those, those, those survey points will be picked up by the surveyors in the field. And once they pick that up and incorporate that into their J file, that file comes back into our office within the survey department. And that information goes into the GIS. Once we plot that information into the GIS that they picked up in the field, we, we will be able to see exactly where they went to put those marks and be, and be able to determine if they're accurate or not. So it, it also acts as, as our best checking point to ensure that every portion of work that's done is done with quality. Aside from that, the Survey and Mapping Department uses GIS to manage all other data coming from other sectors of government. For example, road networks the measurement of road. When public works are doing measure, are doing our works on roads, they use us for, to get the measurement so they can know how much material is needed to fix those roads. From a from a disaster management sector, where, when 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 there's a storm and they need assistance with flood mapping, we, we, we assist with that. From a perspective of, of fisheries, monitoring monitoring um, wildlife, grass beds, uh, national parks. We, we assist with that. It, it, straight down to um, elections. The elections office, we, we, we're the ones that take care of the, the delineation for the electoral district boundaries. So all sectors of, of government tie back into the survey and mapping department. And we, we are grateful to have that opportunity to be able to enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of the operations in TCIG by the use of GIS. So thank you very much for listening to me and I look forward to hearing from you guys. You can email me at dwilliams at gov.tc for more information and we look forward to incorporating more young people into the realm of GIS. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Julian Time uh, and I'm the project manager for the Marine Spatial Project, Marine Spatial Planning Project here in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Uh, and I work for the South Atlantic Environmental Research Institute. Hello, my name is Martin Gourne and I'm a project officer in the same project I work with Julian. Okay, so the, the, uh, the project that I'm working on, is a, a, or that we're working on, is a, a Darwin-funded project that's a collaboration between uh, the South Atlantic Environmental Research Institute and the Department of Environment and Coastal Resources here in the Turks and Caicos Islands. <coughs> And the aim is to develop uh, tools for marine spatial planning in the Turks and Caicos Islands. The marine spatial planning is a stakeholder driven uh, scientific approach to manage the marine environment. Um, and the, the aim is to um, take into consideration the multiple uses and the community uses uh, of the sea uh, while also aiming to um, achieve um, ecological, economic, and uh, social and cultural uh, objectives. So as part of that, um, uh, that project, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, uh, we've been developing some tools uh, to help with the decision-making process um, and managing the real environment. And we have um, the WebGIS tool uh, and also a data portal tool. Um, so 
the web uh, GIS application um, is basically to allow the spatial data to be visualized um, and it's open to, um, to the public um, and the public can um, look at the protected areas that are around the Turks and Caicos Islands uh, and if they're interested in uh, the protected area that uh, they're looking at they can click on one of the areas and um, some information will come up um, about the protected area that they're interested in. Now, um, apart from that, there are other layers on here, such as that one, such as some human activities. So we can look at swim zones uh, within the protected areas. Um, so you can see there's some swim zones in the Princess Alexandra National Park. Um, off of uh, Grace Bay. Uh, you can also look at some, uh, some dive locations uh, around the same area or around the, the Turks and Caicos Islands as well. Um, but from a, um, I guess from a management point of view, um, these are all um, important to know where they are and, um, and that. But also um, we look at uh, species um, information and habitats. So we have some uh, turtle data uh, that was provided by the guys from um, um, Exeter University and uh, <coughs> the Marine Conservation Department in the UK. Um, and they did some turtle tracking uh, a few years ago off of um, north, the south of North Caicos, uh, of Middle Caicos and East Caicos. Um, and if I load that up now, you can see all the turtle tracks that they were able to record. And some of these, these were juvenile um, green turtles. Um, and some of these turtles um, ventured as far as uh, South America and around other areas of the, of the Caribbean. But from this turtle tracking uh, data, uh, they're able to create some kernel density maps, um, which basically indicate the utilization of a particular area around the um, Middle Caicos. And then what we can do um, to look at other areas around the islands that might be important for, for juvenile uh, green turtles. We can overlay um, these on a habitat map and then do some analyses um, and mainly um, possibly be able to predict other areas around the, the Turks and Caicos Islands um, that may be important to um, juvenile green, green turtles. Um, and it's been uh, suggested that the Turks and Caicos Island Islands is an important um, area for uh, juvenile green turtles um, as they grow into to adults and move further afield. Um, and with this um, application, it's possible that uh, students who are working on um, projects in, uh, in their schools or, or colleges um, are able to access the open version um, and also link data to their projects. Uh, or download uh, open data to their projects that they're working on um, for, for, for their schoolwork. Um, and it may be that um, there is the, the facility um, on this uh, application to be able to draw polygons, lines and, and point features as well, which may be useful for, um, for school um, students to be able to, to learn how to use um, the GIS applications. So the second uh, feature in the marine spatial planning tools is a, a data portal. A data portal is actually the metadata catalog online. But what is actually the metadata and the metadata catalog? So metadata is a data about the data. So it's basically the information about the data, what is inside, how it was created, what is a special accent and all of this information. So metadata catalog is just a list of the data sets which are available in the data repository and with all the information about this data. And we have it uh, in the form of data portal, which uh, by default looks like uh, a list of groups with different types of the data. So you can see we have uh, about 15 or 16 groups with different layers. 
And uh, what you can see, what you can do here, you can basically search for the data which you are interested. You can see, uh, you can search for specific data. So, for example, if you are interested to see all the layers, you can go to datasets and then you will see the list of all available datasets in the data repository. Uh, the idea of uh, the metadata catalog or the data portal is to show all the resources which we have in the, in the data repository, no matter if they are open or restricted. The only difference is if you, between these different levels of accessibility, is if you are able to download the data or not. So in this situation, you can see that national boundaries are open. And then you see this small uh, link here, which says you are able to download this data directly from the data portal. But in the second uh, case, which is Reef Tropical Western Atlantic data Database, this database is not open, it's restricted. And that's why you can only read the information about this uh, layer. So you can see or you can know that we have these layers in our data repository. But to have access to it, you have to contact either someone who is specified here, but if the contact mail address, like in this case, is hidden, then you can navigate directly to uh, the data manager. To find a contact to the data manager, you can go to About, and then you will see some information about the project and for more information and data availability, please contact the data manager. So this will redirect you to the email address of the data manager in the DCR. Uh, you can uh, sort or search the data sets using different uh, things, like you can search them by groups, by tags, formats, and even licenses or region topics. Um, and I think that's it from the data portal, actually. <laughs>Hi, my name is Mark Wilkinson. I am the Radio Communications and Telecommunications Manager at the, the Department of Disaster Management and Emergencies. Here, I'll explain to you the interrelation between GIS and radio and telecommunications. Radio and telecommunications actually plays a major role and hinge a big part of, of its development on GIS data. From the inception of radio communications development, we always know about fixed locations and geographic positions. In radio communications in the Turks and Caicos, we use GIS information <coughs> and data to identify some of our antenna locations. In the telecommunication industry, this is also used to position antennas at specific distances and locations that would see each other in a line of sight direction that would allow us to pass electromagnetic waves and allow the free and uninterrupted transmission of radio data. As time progressed, we moved really into a more efficient stage we have moved from using a lot of radio communications globally into satellite communications. Satellite communications allow, allows us to use GIS information by communicating directly to a satellite. At DDME, we heavily rely on these type of equipment and systems during our emergency and disaster times. We use satellite phones, which is widely used across um, our government. We use uh, B-guns, which are <coughs> broadband local area network systems and the VSAT systems. Our VSAT systems are a more largely ex uh, larger designed system that uses a satellite dish that communicates to a satellite. By us doing this, 
we are actually passing GIS information and using the GIS principle by having a fixed position on Earth and a satellite orbit orbiting our atmosphere. <clears throat> so, to summarize it, communications and radio communications are interconnected with GIS. My name is Katrina Harris. I am a geography teacher at the Clement Tower High School. Today we had a session with the DDME um, for upcoming GIS Day. The session was actually amazing. The students were really, really excited about what was taught. They were interactive. DDME actually um, inspired them. They were able to actually practice or put in information um, on a computer system um, for GIS, putting in different layers of information. Um, one of the projects or one of the objectives was for them to create an evacuation map um, for tsunami and they were actually able to do that excellently. Um, they took turns in putting on the layers of information and they were really, really excited to know that they were a part of creating such a map. Um, in terms of GIS and for the students, fourth and fifth form students here, it's extremely important for them because even though it's geographical information system, geography in itself is a wide field. And so, even though they may not want to pursue a career in uh, geography per se, even if they are in the field of business, even if, if, if they're in the field of uh, maybe energy or whatever the case may be, or even said DDME, disaster management and so forth, um, they, can, they can definitely utilize that information for their benefit. Hello everyone, my name is Ariane Gardner and I am a student of Clement Howell High School. Today we'll learn about GIS and all the tools and preparations it takes to prepare for a natural hazard in Turks and Caicos Islands. Well hello there Turks and Caicos, my name is Tariq Jennings and I am a student of the Clement Howell High School. Now in today's session with the DDME officials, it was a wonderful session actually because it has inspired me as an aspiring meteorologist and and it can benefit me in the future when I finish when I'm finished with my studies. Today was a very interesting session where we had learned how to make an evacuation map in case of a tsunami. Today we learned the difference between information and data, which is was very hard to tell that there was a difference before, but I have learned a lot in this session. Thank you. When I am a meteorologist, okay. I will use GIS to give you guys accurate information and also give you guys updates and stuff that are happening in our country. Thank you, DDME and happy GIS day. So Kev, I thoroughly enjoyed the tour. I learned a lot. It was very informative and educational. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Yes, and I hope you are inspired. I hope you were engaged and interested on, in what we had to offer and what the GIS community of Turks and Caicos also had to offer. This brings us to the end of our show and we enjoyed our time with you. We would like to thank all our contributors and participants, and of course you, our viewers. our viewers. For more information, remember to visit www.gov.tc slash DDME. Until next year, stay safe and happy, happy GIS, GIS Day. Day. Happy GIS Day. Happy GIS Day. Happy GIS Day. Have a great GIS day.
Happy GIS Day, Turks and Caicos Islands. Happy, Happy GIS Day, Day Turks, Turks and Caicos. Caicos. Happy GIS Day. Happy GIS Day, Turks and Caicos. Happy GIS Day. Happy GIS Day, Turks and Caicos.